have you or a loved one ever been to your doctor's office or to a dietitian or a nutritionist and they gave you nutrition advice and then you proceeded to follow that nutrition advice. You did what you were told and you continued to get sicker and fatter and you had to take more and more medication. Well, I've got a, a treat for you today. If this has ever happened to you, I have a licensed registered dietitian who has just released a new book that she wrote and I want to introduce you to her. I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. This is Michelle Hearn, licensed registered dietitian. Let me see if I can add her. <laughs> there she is. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Dr. Barry. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here with you. I'm excited. I can already tell you and I are on the same wavelength and we're probably going to ruffle some feathers and Good. make piss off a doctor and, and, and a dietitian or two today, which always makes me happy because when you make a professional upset, that also usually makes them think. And they're yes. like, how could these two crazy people be so wrong? Well, maybe maybe I should look in the mirror. So that's our that's our intention today. And I hope that there are many dietitians, nutritionists, doctors, advanced practice nurses, physicians, assistants watching this today. If you know a healthcare provider like that and you want them to hear this message, please share this video with them. I think that they might learn a thing or two, at least from Michelle today. So Michelle, introduce yourself and tell us your story and tell us about this book that you had the audacity. Yes. Uh, thank you. Well, yes, like I said, thanks so much for having me on. So I'm a registered and licensed dietitian, but my story actually starts and I'll try to, you know, speed this up. But I actually, when I was 12, I had a very serious eating disorder. I was diagnosed with anorexia. I was almost five feet tall. I was 57 and a half pounds. So for people who are science minded, my BMI was 11.7. You know, it was very sick, heart failure, kidney failure. Um, actually, a uh, doctor told my parents I had about a 10% chance to survive. And so I was an inpatient treatment for two months. Um, so that's kind of where my health journey started. You know, that was my first interaction with a dietitian. And, you know, fast forward, I decided as I, you know, went through recovery that I wanted to be a dietitian. I wanted to learn, you know, I wanted to help people with nutrition, you know, because I knew it was powerful and I knew it mattered. And then, you know, once I got into, um, you know, to be a dietitian, you have to get your four year degree in dietetics. And I was just really, uh, I was really shocked at the education I was receiving. And I would ask questions. And that's something that I do in my book, you guys. I'm going to hold it up real quick. The Dietitian's Dilemma. And we'll talk more about this. But I, I would, even as a young dietitian, I would ask questions like, you know, it doesn't really make sense to me. This person has diabetes, so they can't metabolize carbs. But we're giving them 75 grams of carbohydrates a meal and then dosing them with insulin. Like, why don't we just give them less carbs? Oh, Michelle, they, ha they have to have carbs. Everybody has to have carbs. And then two feeding formulas. If somebody's in a traumatic car accident, you flip over the back of the two feeding formula. And I would just say things like, hey, um, I noticed the ingredients are maltodextrin, high fructose corn syrup, and uh, soy protein. Those are the ingredients I was fed when I was 12 in the inpatient treatment center. I had 24 hour two feeding. So I'm like, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> you know, and so I would just ask questions Is this the best way to do something? And then as somebody who's suffered with an eating disorder, you know, I'm obviously I'm weight restored, but I've suffered with anxiety, depression at times um, throughout my adolescence, suicidal ideation. And, you know, I, I was just told like, hey, you know what? These are symptoms you're going to have to manage the rest of your life. These are the cards you were dealt. And so I decided like, OK, gosh, this, this is just the life I was going to live. And that's what I was told. You know, I was told recovery means your weight restored, but you're constantly going to have, you know, chronic thoughts around food. And I felt like, Dr. Barry, for so much of my life, I was, um, you know, kind of on the sideline. I was watching it happen, you know, and I, I come from a very high achieving family. My two oldest sisters are doctors. My next oldest sister is a fluent Japanese veterinarian. And I just, it was hard. It was hard. But I, and I've always been an athlete. You know, I, um, I run 12 marathons. I qualified for Boston 12 times. And I really wanted to qualify for the Olympic trials and the marathon. So to do that, you guys, you have to run under two hours and 45 minutes for a marathon. For reference, that's a six minute and 17 a mile for 26 miles. And I ran a 254. And so I was getting close. And I was eating a ton of carbohydrates throughout all my dietetics career. You know, I was just told you got to have all those whole grains, you know, you know, a wheat bread. And, and it wasn't like I was eating, you know, bagels and, you know, mounds of pasta. I was eating a lot of oatmeal. 
um, I suffered with anemia, severe anemia. And we can also talk more about that. Like, why, why does that happen? You know, so many dietitians and even my doctor just said, oh, that just must be you're genetically prone to anemia. Um, but it wasn't until I really lost my own health that I really made that big change. You know, in 2019, I was, you know, I was strugg struggling with some depression and anxiety, but at least I had my running. Okay, I'm gonna, I had my running to fall back on. And it just seemed like my running fell off a cliff. All of a sudden, I couldn't run. I couldn't go out. I'd go out for two or three miles and I'd break out in cold sweat. So just like so many people that you talk to, like, what do you do? Okay, I talked to my doctor. My doctor said, oh, you're a little low on magnesium and we'll up your antidepressant. Like, oh, okay, I don't think that's going to help. So I called a sports dietitian. I said, hey, help me. This is what I'm doing. At that point, I was eating 350 grams of carbs a day. And they told me, you need more carbohydrates. And I said, are you sure? Okay. And well, okay, more carbohydrates. And as you can imagine, that took my running from falling off a cliff to like cliff diving. It was, it was terrible. And the kind of the come to Jesus moment was I was, um, I had a really tough day at work. I'll never forget this. I came home, went to bed early and I was just, I was having all this pain. I was having muscle pain, spasms, all this different stuff. And I woke up at two in the morning and it just felt like my legs were on fire. And so <laughs> I got up, drove to 7-Eleven, got like 30 pounds of ice, put it in the bathtub. So it is, it's three in the morning. I'm sitting in the bathtub and I'm just crying. And my wife came in and was like, you know what? I think it's time you do something different. And it was beyond time. And I had just decided I'd followed all the advice. I'd followed all the nutrition guidelines. I was eating whole grains, fruits. I was taking iron supplements. I was doing everything they told me to do. And I just said, you know what? I'm too old. You know, I was, I was 36. I'm 37 now. I can't run anymore. And so I was like, well, if I'm not going to run, maybe I should easy tiger on the carbs. Like why not follow a low carb diet? Right. And so then I was, uh, I was, I was just exploring the car low carb diet. I thought maybe I'll be ketogenic. And my only goal, I just want my legs to stop hurting. I was having spasms and I just hurt everywhere. And I'm used to being sore. I've been a runner my whole life. So I know what like soreness is. And I'm sure you're like working out, you know what soreness is, but you're not supposed to wake up two or three times in the night with like searing pain. And right. uh, that's when I came across Sean Baker. And I remember, I will never forget. He's like, whoa, like I can get behind me. Like I like meat, meat's good. I'm from Texas, but all meat. But here's the thing, Dr. Barry, like so much, this is a big problem. People see something and they just freak out. And I'll admit at first I kind of, whoa. But then I said, okay, he looks really fit. And then I got online and I, I met um, Sarah, Sarah Kleiner, carnivore yogi. Like I messaged her, you look really happy. I'm not happy. I'm a mess. And I started to do some, you know, people told me, you know what, there's clinical trials on low carb. And I'm like, no, there can't be. I'm a dietitian. And I would have, they would have shown me this. They would have taught me this. And then I, there are more, this is something that I tell everybody. I did not know this until I talked to Dr. Westman. There are more clinical trials on a low carb diet showing it is eff its efficacy, it works, it's safety and it's sustainability than any other diet out there, than the Mediterranean diet, vegetarian diet, vegan diet, incredible, incredible. And so then I was like, okay, you know, I was like, okay, so I'm gonna try the carnivore diet. And I also at this point discovered Zach Bitter, who is a, I was like, he's a long distance runner running off low carb, my mind was blown. And so I told my wife, I said, hey, look, I'm going to follow an all meat diet for 30 days. And uh, I'm sure like a lot of people, she was not having it. Like, nope, this is unhealthy. This is not good for you. And to be fair, there's a, there's a, there's some dogma. There's this message that it's restrictive. It's, it's not going to, you know, all foods have to fit. And I, I have a history of an eating disorder. And so we fought about this. <laughs> we fought pretty uh, back and forth and she cried and I felt terrible. And finally she's like, you know what, Shell? go ahead, try this. You're going to quit. It's not going to work. It's not sustainable. It's not good for you. And I can't even, I can't, I can't even tell you exactly why, but I just had this feeling like, I just want to try this. And it was a little weird because I was still working in acute care at that time as a dietitian. So here I am, you know, all the dietitian women are eating their bagels and their donuts and their oatmeal. And I come in with this like pound of ground beef. And they're like, that's different. Um, but yeah, but you know, within the first week, all of a sudden my muscle pain was gone, but I was like, okay, well, I'm not running. And then I will never forget. Um, 
about the second week, we were in a team meeting and my dietitian coworker was kind of like tapping her fingers and she was like, I'm, I'm so hungry. Do you, do you want me to get, to get you a snack? Are you hungry? And I was like, Christy, we're going to eat at like noon or something. And she's like, Michelle, it's two. And my life used to be ruled by the clock. I'd eat breakfast. I'd eat oatmeal at eight. I was hungry and achy at 10. I was you know, eating granola bars. Like it was ridiculous. I was snacking three, four times a day. I was, I was having so much glucose and insulin responses, but I just thought that's how it was. I thought this is what I have to do as an athlete. And I'll never forget that. I was like, wow, I'm kind of calm. This is new. And then another pivotal moment was it was about the third week that my wife was like, hey, can you come sit with me? And I sat down next to her and I held her hand and she said, I'm not sure if I like this yet, but this is the best your anxiety has been in the 11 years that I've known you. 11 years, three weeks. I've known people who have struggled with anxiety and depression. I share in the book, we have a whole chapter on mental illness. I've known four people who've taken their own lives, three weeks. So that's when I was, you, know, you get angry. You get like, are you, what's going on? So then I decided, you know, I was like, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've had people because I even came, you know, you think when you get really excited, you tell your coworkers like, this is amazing. And they just kind of dismiss you. I would bring in clinical trials and they're like, eh. and I couldn't teach it. That was the problem in the hospital setting. People have diabetes, you know, and so if you're not familiar, you guys, if you haven't been in the hospital, um, we're not just seeing people who are like, oh, Mary's 20 pounds of her weight. I've seen wounds to the bone. I've seen legs amputated. I've seen strokes at 48. The youngest person I've seen that had a stroke was 32. I've seen heart disease in um, people in their 20s. You know, we're seeing obese kids. The, the fastest growing demographic of obesity is ages two to five. You know, I saw a type two diabetic that was eight. <laughs> we no longer call it adult onset, you know, diabetes. Exactly. And we cannot teach them. And so I know I've, I've talked a ton. So yeah, please no, feel free to interrupt me. Or, right. you were, yeah. I love it when you preach. So <laughs> let's let's use that, what you just said, because I think all of us at some point in our life have trusted the nutrition advice of the doctor, dietitian, nutritionist, nurse, and it didn't serve us well. And I think many of us had our own aha moment when we became sick. I personally became morbidly obese and pre-diabetic and had a list of complicated, just, just, I felt like shit every day. Yeah. And so I started out with paleo and you, you were talking about snacking earlier. I used, I would, you know, I had a nine hour clinic day, five days a week, mm -hmm. and then was often working in the emergency department on the weekend. I snacked constantly. I had a key to the the hospital cafeteria because they got tired. The nurse got tired of letting me in. The, the charge <laughs> nurse. Here's a key. Yeah, I'm sick. Yeah. I'm no, I hear you. I had to eat every two hours. I thought I had to. And now you and I both know we don't. But let's talk about this advice. Let's talk about dietitians in particular, since you are one and you went through the entire process. What's wrong with dietitians? Yeah, because I would think even as a doctor, and I can imagine that a patient would think that as a dietitian, they trained you in a full spectrum of dietary ways of eating, even if nothing more to say. Now, there, there's this low carb way of eating. There's some literature on it, but we don't recommend it. But you're saying that even though the low carb diet has more research published than any other diet, you didn't hear a word about it in dietitians uh, training. I mean, the only, honestly, the only thing I've ever heard about a low carb diet as, as a dietitian was that it is dangerous. It's unethical. Um, it can cause heart disease. Too much meat will cause cancer. All the myths is what we really heard. And unfortunately, like what's wrong with dietetics? I mean, I have a whole chapter in the book. It's called where the F <laughs> the, my editor didn't want me to put the full word. Where the F did the nutrition guidelines come from? And obviously, yeah. you know, it has an incredible history. It's, it's bizarre, you guys. But as far as the Academy of Nutrition, when I became a dietitian back in 2009, the Academy of Nutrition's top sponsors were Coca-Cola, um, General Mills and PepsiCo. And it's not much better today. Coca-Cola is no longer a sponsor, but Pepsi, Frito-Lay, ConAgra, um, they're funneling tons of money into, you know, the dietetics. And so, you know, people tell me that. Yesterday, I looked prep, preparing for this. I was trying to find who their current big sponsors are, and I couldn't find it, it anywhere. Oh, they, send it to you. It's hidden. It's hidden. Oh, it, you have to, yeah. Yeah, and, that's I mean, what I was thinking. They're probably not very proud of that anymore. They're starting to hide that information. They're still taking the money. Oh, yeah. But they're, they're hiding who their sponsors are. So what – Every dietitian means well. You guys yes. go, go through all this training to help people. That's why you do it. 
So how do they get it so wrong? What yeah. happens along the way? Is there just no opportunity to say, yeah, but what about this low carb thing I heard about? Just explain so people, just yes. regular people yes. understand how the hell could a discipline that is about nothing but human nutrition. Yes. And I know a lot of your training is about, is about TPN and, and, you know, burn victims and ICU victims and how to, how to replace their stuff. Cause that's a special form of training, but just the, the feeding of normal humans out, out on walking the street, how did schools of dietetics get it so wrong? Yes, that's a great question. And I do want to validate what you said initially, because I 110% agree. Like, I have never met someone that goes into healthcare that is like, you know what, I really don't give a shit about people like everybody that goes in like genuinely wants to help like every single human that I've ever met. And so what happens, though, is as soon as you get put in, you know, you go in like bright eyed and bushy tails, I want to help like you are immediately overrun with I mean, first of all, you you are required to follow the guidelines. It is every hospital I've worked in, it is not optional. You are going to prescribe the guidelines that we set forth. You even, every hospital, you have to use our printouts. You can't even use anything, you can't make your own. And so you're like, okay, th this, this is what I have to practice. If someone is diabetic, I have to give them this. So you do that. You're like, okay, cool, this person needs fruits and vegetables. But then you see them the next month and they're really sick. And you, you're like, well, why are you sick? Oh, you must not be following it. Okay, so we start to blame the patient. And then we hear doctors talk about it. And it's like, oh, okay, it's just they're lazy. They need to, they need to move more if they would just eat less, you know, that 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 myth of move more, eat less. And then we see patients, we put them on these highly restrictive diets. You know, a heart healthy diet, I have, you can't order beef. It's crazy at the hospital. If you're on a heart healthy diet, you can order as many carbs as you want. I had a guy get 142 grams of carbs, 25 grams of sugar, but they won't let him order, you know, saturated fat and salt. Right. So it, there, yeah, there's this weird dogma and I see it in dietitians and I even see younger dietitians start to question like, I don't, I don't think this is right or I don't think that I like this. But then it's like, what do you do? You cannot practice outside of those guidelines. And if you're like me, you're a dietitian and you're working for a hospital chain yes. and you start, you say, I'm not doing that anymore. And you, and you just started making up your own handouts to give patients. What would happen to you? Um, <laughs> it's happened to me twice. Uh, twice I gave, um, advice that I felt would be more helpful. And once a patient was just really excited cause they felt better and they told a nurse and I was suspended. And the other time I, um, similar, similar situation to where I was suspended and then you'll be, you'll be fired, you know? And, and unfortunately the dietetics community is very small. It's kind of like the, the big kind of ADA president higher up, um, they know each other. So you, if you're suspended or expelled, it's going to be very challenging to get another job, you know? And I brought, when I, when I worked in Colorado, that was my second job as a dietitian. I brought up concerns. I said, look, I have this huge patient load. And as you know, every patient you see, you got it. I see you for five minutes. Cause I've got 20 people. I have to chart for like half an hour. I don't feel like I'm helping anybody. And, um, I, I help me. What do I do? And she was just like her. She was just like, Hey, look, they can get help on their own time. Like we're just trying to get insurance reimbursement here. And it was just like, I felt like someone punched me in the chest. I said, no, I want to be very help. honest because ultimately in a hospital setting, whether you're the emergency room physician or whether you're the dietitian on the floor, it's all about, did you document this correctly? Did you code this correctly? Can we bill for this? That, yep. I mean, that's not a joke guys. You think maybe think she's overblowing that, but that's a hundred percent true. You could literally cure cancer in a hospital setting and if you didn't do it following the guidelines, it didn't code correctly for it, and, and they couldn't bill for it, the hospital system would not be interested. That's 100% true. Now, I know that you're a bit of an athlete. Yes, sir. And a question I get all the time is, will eating a meat-heavy keto diet or eating a ketovore diet or a carnivore diet, will that affect my athletic performance, my lifting, my running times, Sure. Let's talk about that. Will eating a, a meat diet, will that affect your athletic performance? Yeah. So when I when I transitioned to purely meat-based diet, I had no intentions to run anymore. Like I thought my 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 dream is done, my goals are done. I kind of told a lot of people, like, I'm just not gonna run anymore. And that was hard because I mean that'd been my whole life. And then, you know, as you read in the book, like I was around more. So my wife just kind of casually suggested, like, you know, yet you're annoying me. Will you go for a run? And I was just like, Ooh, I don't know if I can run on low carb. And I was like, I'm just going to go run a mile. It's fine. It, it, you know, and I figured if it was, if I couldn't do it, I would just walk. I left the house and ran eight miles. Steady, pure energy. 
and I couldn't believe it. I was like, I thought I had to have carbs. And that's when I reached out to Zach Bitter and said, okay, let's do something crazy. Let's, let's try this. And um, I mean, long story short, I, I started training for ultra marathons. And to be fair, like, yeah, if you're a very high carb athlete, and Zach did a good job of preparing me for this, as you transition to a low carb athlete, we kept our volume very low, or I mean, intensity very low. Meaning, mm -hmm. yeah, for that during that transition period, you may have a decline in performance. And I mean, I was just doing long, easy miles. But then, oh my gosh, I, um, you know, I signed up, well, I signed up for a race last May, but because of COVID, it got canceled. And then we signed up for one in October and it got canceled. But finally, November 7th, 2020, I got to toe the line. I ran my first ultra marathon. It was a six hour race. So how far can you run in six hours? It was loops. I ran 44.63 miles. So that's an 804 pace. I won the race and that ended up being the second fastest or second best time in 2020. Um, so yeah, it's going pretty well, <laughs> I would say. And yeah, I do, I do, we do strategically use some carbs. But I use, it's amazing, like the amount of carbs I eat now, I eat less carbs like in a week than I used to in a day, you know? And I, and, and what I found is so much, I was eating so much plants. I thought I had to eat all these greens and all this starch that there are so many things in plants that actually can block the absorption of nutrition. That's another thing. We don't teach dietitians this. We don't, nobody well, told me. Guys get no training about the anti-nutrients contained. No. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was told spinach is great. Eat all the spinach. I mean, it's less, you know, you'll have to eat more of it to get as much as steak, but it's the same. It's all the same. Like nobody taught me about oxalates, about um, lectins, especially for, for me, phytic acid. Like I shared earlier, I was anemic. So anemic that I literally fell asleep on my computer at work. I typed like a 12 page email with like the letter S with my face. Like, and now my iron is better than ever. Nobody said, hey, Michelle, it's great that you're taking iron supplements, but if you're eating oatmeal, it has phytic acid and it's gonna bind and it's not gonna, you know, but probably my main, and, it, and it's so frustrating because you know, like I said, once I decide, like once you hear this, I just couldn't, I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to share it. I, I We can reverse diabetes, as you know, Dr. Barry, in weeks. I, I had, I've had patients that had diabetes for 20 years. I had, you know, I've held hands of people that are, you know, about to get their legs amputated. And it's like, we can do this quickly, effectively, and easily. But guess what? There's only two ways, to, you know, there's only one way to make money in healthcare. I have to keep you sick. If I heal you, you're gone. I can't kill you. So I'm not going to like, <laughs> yeah, you got to stay perpetually sick, yeah. you know? Yeah, said not to do that. But if I just let you suffer slowly for decades, then I can bill a lot of visits. And I really don't think that individual practice of medicine, doctors and dietitians, I don't think anybody's thinking that. No, but it's, the, it's bigger, the grand scheme of- uh, Some of the bigger hospital chains, I sometimes wonder if somebody's sitting at the top thinking thoughts like that, and it's really worrisome. Everybody's loving your shirt, Michelle. Uh, oh, the, 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 the food pyramid on the very bottom here, it says, eat meat, repeat. Eat yeah, me, Etsy. There's Get on Etsy. Way. Everybody wants a, a t-shirt. Etsy, type it in. <laughs> it's 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 one of my favorite. I need to get another one. I got one you saw. I've got like a grease meat stain on it. But um, yeah, you know, and it's it, once again, like people have good intentions. Like this is not any one dietitian or one person. Like everybody wants to do the right thing, but then you're in this system and you're just you're not allowed. If every and that's what I want, Dr. Barry. That is my goal with writing the book. I want every dietitian to be able to prescribe a low carb, high fat diet as an option. We are all adults. I'm not anyone's moral coach or mom or whatever. If you want to take insulin and um, eat carbohydrates when you're diabetic, that's okay. As long as you understand, you're probably gonna lose a limb, you're probably gonna go blind, and you're, you're probably gonna have a pretty shitty quality of life, but you get to make that choice. But another, a dietitian should say, here's an alternate option. And same thing with mental health. Like my mom is bipolar, you know? I, I have a history of anxiety. If someone had told me, Michelle, you have lifelong anxiety, you have racing thoughts, you have a history of an eating disorder. And this was my message too. Like there's gonna be people that watch this that are struggling with depression. If someone had said, look, why don't you try this for three or four weeks? You've been, maybe people have been medicated for years, you know? And, and, and that was another reason I wanted to write the book. Like I've written, I've read a lot of books about depression and about eating disorders. And sometimes I feel like we just don't, I, I couldn't find something that really grabbed the hopelessness what is it like to feel like you just don't want to live anymore, you know? And if yeah. somebody had said, look, here's an option. 
it would have totally changed my life. So I'm out to do that. And I've had several dietitians email me and say, look, they're going to come for your license. This is, and you know, you have a oh, Michelle, all foods can fit all things in moderation. I had someone email me and tell me that, um, telling people not to eat carbs makes them sad. It's restrictive. And let me tell you what? what's sad is a poor quality of life. 100%. You know, everyone that I've talked to, and I'm sure you would say the same thing, you probably have never felt more happy and free than you have now. Oh, absolutely. The just the centered energy, not having to think, is it time to eat yet? There's the book. Yeah. I, I want yeah, to Yeah, someone's asking what the book is, and not just me trying to <laughs> the book is up here on Facebook, down there on YouTube, and I don't know where the hell it's at on Twitter. But get a copy of this book. It's it's one of those books where obviously Michelle knows her stuff, but she's able to break this down so that even just somebody with no nutrition training at all gets the key takeaway points. And that's what's really important because, yeah, and I think this is something that happens so commonly, Michelle, doctors and dietitians, they just think patients don't get it. They think patients don't care. It's like, I'm not going to waste my time counseling this, this person about diet. They're not going to do it anyway. They're going to lay on the couch and eat Cheetos. I know they are. So why am I wasting my time? <clears throat> But what I found since I started this social media thing is that people are hungry for an answer. They don't want another pill. They don't want a lifetime of morbid obesity and losing a toe, then a foot, then the lower leg, then the upper leg. They don't want to go to dialysis. They don't want that. But they don't know there's an alternative. And the reason that doctors get tired of giving nutrition advice, and I would suspect the same is true for dietitians, is that the, the stupid advice that we're trained to give never works yeah and it here's the thing I, and I've got some flack for them. There, and, and like you said earlier I used to secretly think my patients were all just non-compliant like they're not listening they're, they're eating donuts on the couch they're not <laughs> they're not eating lots of whole grains and avoiding bacon they're just yeah. Eating, yeah but that that's not true and so when I started to offer my most morbidly obese patients Hey, and they're because I had lost 70 pounds, right? And mm -hmm. they're like, Doc, what the hell did you do? I'm like, why would I not share this? Why would I not share this thing that did work? Because I'd already tried the ADA diet and I'd already tried going to the gym and jogging and all this other stuff. No, that worked. Yeah. This worked and it worked pretty effortlessly, right? Like I really didn't have to try. I just had to eat meat until I was full. And so I started sharing it with my most morbidly obese patients, thinking that's where the least liability would be because, you know, they're already 400 pounds. What else could go wrong? Sure. And these people, they started to literally transform. Every th When I would see them every three months, they, they were transforming in front of my eyes. And so healthcare providers, if you're watching this, yeah, it's boring giving people nutrition advice if you're giving advice that never works, that's really boring. But when you give advice that has immediate effects, like Michelle said, reversing type two diabetes in, in a few weeks or a few months, that's not boring. I promise you that's not boring at all. That's a lot of fun. I want to ask you a, one more question about the kickback. I know you were suspended a couple of times from the hospital for trying to give proper human diet advice that, that yes. was not meshing with the guidelines. What about just colleagues, uh, other dietitians? Have you gotten any private advice like, hey, what are you doing? What, what kind of kind of behind the scenes kickback have you gotten or questions asked? Or have you had any dietitians that are like, God, all your patients are getting better. What are you doing? Yeah, I I definitely I'm, I'm really encouraged, at least on social media. I've had several dietitians reach out to me. I actually said we need to start like a group called Rogue Dietitians because a lot of dietitians are saying like, look, I'm starting to use this in a private practice. Like in and they almost have to go under like a health coach, even though they have the dietetics background. Right. Um, but so so there are several I want to validate. And I appreciate everyone that sent me a really positive message. Thank you, because I'm sure, Dr. Barry, I get some pretty uh, nasty <laughs> messages, especially on Twitter. My goodness, you guys be nice. Um, but yeah, actually, interestingly, when I worked in the hospital setting and I share this and I got a lot of people that were got a little bent out of shape about this, but I've worked in now in three different. And when I worked in one of the companies, I also had a psychiatric facility I worked in about 60 percent of the dietitians I've worked with are obese. And so a lot of people looked at me as just like, oh, well, she's just genetically lean and she can do whatever. And this meat thing is gross and terrible. So unfortunately, at least in the hospital setting, I got a lot of, I, I didn't have any dietitian in the hospital setting come to me and be like, wow, this is interesting. Tell me more. Or wow, I'm really overweight and you seem to feel really good. Tell me more. But uh, through social media, through my Instagram, my website, people have come and said like, look, I'm trying this low carb, you know, high fat thing out for my patients. And it's been amazing. 
like, and I've had a few people, you know, I have a YouTube channel and, you know, I've been have dietitians in the book and certainly health coaches in the book that have just in doing incredible stuff. And I'm just like, I can, if, if dietitians in the hospital did this, we would change people's lives, but yep. it's just not set up that way. It's set up that we go in, we give the same terrible advice that doesn't work. Patients order, you know, people are shocked. If you're on a diabetic diet at the hospital, you can order a caramel macchiato brownie and chips and you'll just get insulin. Like that's terrible advice. And that's, yeah, you know. So, so, so terrible. You mentioned mental health earlier, and that's something I really wanted you to talk about. Uh, eating disorders are they, they are a blend of this gastrointestinal with mental. And it's like this, it's one of the hardest things, as you know, it's one of the hardest conditions to, as, a, as a healthcare provider to even try to treat. It's really, really difficult for the patient and for the provider. Let's talk about mental illness. Let's talk about eating yeah. disorders. Let's get this Do out there because this yeah. is important. And anybody watching this, if you have a loved one who has an eating disorder, please share this video with them. This might be the thing that changes their life. Yeah. And so, you know, certainly with eating disorders, it's it's so controversial because the the current treatment for eating disorders is the standard American diet. It doesn't matter if you're extremely underweight with anorexia or you're obese and you have like a binge eating disorder, even if you're normal weight, you have binge eating disorder. But here's the thing is I want to challenge the dogma. And, I, you know, we talk about this in the book. So what, cause like I said, my, my anxiety and everything got so much better after a few weeks. So I had to know, like, why? And as you said, statistically, eating disorders, I mean, anorexia has the highest mortality of any any psychiatric disorder. And what I found even more disheartening is people with, you know, bulimia, binge eating disorder, anorexia, is the rate of suicide and depression is significantly higher. The rate of relapse, people going in back into treatment is about 43%. And I'm going to say the rate of um, engaging in behaviors is 100%. I mean, I've certainly there. And the, the rate of people that were chronically ill that like never got better was about 20%. That's huge. And so I have to ask, like, what is not working? And so I want to talk just real quick about neuroplasticity. And what is that, you guys? That is the brain's ability to mold and change. And also when you mold and change, taking in new information. So it doesn't really help you. Let's say you're someone who has an eating disorder and you're going to therapy and you're learning new coping skills. But what if your brain can't process that information? It's kind of like the it goes one ear and out the other. You, you have to be able to process that information. And so why is the brain not processing that information? Well, we have research that when you're eating a lot of those processed carbs and you're eating a lot of seed oils, it actually shifts the neurochemistry in your brain, specifically the neurotransmitter glutamate. You, your brain wants to keep glutamate like level, but when you eat a lot of processed carbs, it's like pedal to the metal. Glutamate levels have been found to be about a hundred times higher in people um, that are depressed, the people that have um, committed suicide. So it's like, we need to we need to realign that. There's a really interesting study in the book I talk about um, with addictions. They actually found that people, uh, cocaine addicts, actually had really high levels of glutamate. And even though these people are going through treatment and there's 12 step programs, um, they literally like their brains, they, they, they were um, falling back into their same patterns. Their brains were not the, the centers of their brains were not like communicating and talking to each other. And of course, the, the study was like, we need a drug that kind of combats this. But Perfect. what I'm telling you is you can do it through nutrition. Yes. We have to set up our brains, you know, for people with like a binge eating disorder or bulimia, or even anorexia. We have to set up our brain to where we level out that neurochemistry and certainly on um, just a physiological level. When we keep our blood sugar stable, when we keep insulin and glucose stable, we're going to keep cortisol low. You know, you're not going to be hungry. It's so confusing. I, you know, someone who struggled with anorexia, when you eat a high carb meal, you can eat a lot of calories. And then two hours later, you're dizzy and shaky. But when you eat a steak and eggs and butter, you can be full and content for hours. And those same things keep your the neurotransmitters in your brain healthy. And that's yep. also with mental illness. Dr. Chris Palmer, I just interviewed him, um, the Human Performance Outliers podcast. We're going to have him on in March. He's doing some incredible work. They, they want to do ketogenic studies, and they're in the process of raising the funds. But you guys, we have case studies, anecdotal studies, that certain people have insulin resistance in the brain. And you might say like, oh, well, I, I, my child has, they're really lean. They, they don't have any insulin resistance. We've been to the doctor or you might be, you know, I don't know, 30, 40, 50. And like, look, all my lab tests come back normal. Guess what? You can have 100% normal. Um, everything can come back normal and you can have insulin resistance in the brain. And I want you guys to think about insulin resistance in the brain like epilepsy. 
Like you didn't do anything wrong. It's not your fault. Babies, babies have epilepsy. They didn't, they didn't get epilepsy from a bad diet. It's just a genetic, it's a, it's an error in metabolism. So your brain, if your brain cannot process those carbohydrates and glucose, you get things happen. For some people, it can be severe, like schizophrenia or hallucinations. For some people, they feel anxious and depressed or suffer from OCD. So it makes sense to me, if my brain can't process glucose, how about I eat in a way where I don't need to? Yep. And will this work 100% for everybody? Absolutely not. But do I think this could work for a large percentage of people? 100%. Yep, I totally agree, 100%. Now, everybody's wanting to know, <clears throat> Michelle, when's the book going to be out on Audible? Because we all have ADD <laughs> and we want to listen to your book while we do something else. OK, um, I'm, I'm currently working on that right now. I <laughs> hopefully you guys don't mind my voice. Maybe I'll do me and uh, my wife or something. But I that is something that's in the process. It is it is available on ebook um, and the paperback. So. And, oh, also, I do want to say that every every purchase, and we'll do this for Audible too. And if you guys get Audible um, for free, we'll you know every time somebody hits an Audible, let's do the, that. We're donating um, to Chris Palmer's trial because I really do want to help get that ketogenic yeah, trial funded yeah. for Hold the book a mental illness, so everybody can see it. Oh, the dietitian's <laughs> dilemma, because that's what I had, you guys. The dietitian's dilemma. Now that I have this information, what do I do? And Doctor Nevada Gray, if you guys are familiar with the paleo pharmacist, you know she wrote the foreword. And it's just beautiful. You know, she had Wada Aquinas syndrome. And I've only seen that once in the hospital. And guys, that's a um, spinal injury. And the person that I saw that had Wada Aquinas um, syndrome, I'll never forget. The doctor walked out and looked at me and said, never going to walk again. And if you read Dr. Nevada Gray's testimony, she said, well, I'm going to try. I think that I've heard that a ketogenic diet can regenerate nerve tissue. I'm going to do everything I can. And three, three years later, she walks and now she's running. So, you know, that's also my message. The body has a tremendous capacity to heal. You guys, yes, the body well. can heal. Yep. When you remove, let's take away those processed carbohydrates. Let's put in meat and put in saturated fat. You and I, Dr. Barry, we could probably do hours and hours. I'm so over this demonization of meat, you know. Yeah. Um, you can it's heal. So tiresome. So tiresome. It, it's, we, you can have a beautiful quality of life, but you have to follow a species specific diet. I, I say, I have, um, we have a mini zoo at my house. I've got a baby tortoise. Um, we have chickens, we have a dog. If I feed the baby tortoise oxalates, it will die. The tortoise yep. has a very species specific diet. Yep. I have a dog. If I feed my dog nothing but kale, she will get very sick and die. Humans, we have a species specific diet. Guess what happens when we feed ourselves nothing but vegetables or highly processed sugar? You can survive, but it's a pretty, you know, sick quality of life. And you probably will eventually die. So yeah, exactly. somebody said, love this girl. Love you too, Julie. Thanks. <laughs> it's exactly like the story my grandfather told me about a pig farmer. He wanted to be a pig farmer. And so he bought a bunch of pigs and he was feeding the pigs and the feed was expensive. And mm -hmm. so he thought, I'm, you know, I'm going to start giving them 10% sawdust. I'm going to mix that with their feed. And if the pigs did fine, he's like, hey, there you go. But I guarantee you, if, if he'd have had a vet, veterinarian checking the pig's lab work, they wouldn't be fine. But they appeared yeah. to be fine to this farmer. And so he increased it to 20% sawdust and then 30%. And then when he got to 50%, all his pigs died. <laughs> and that, that, that story is absolutely true in humans. Yes, you can limp by eating highly processed carbs. They're not going to kill you immediately because if they were going to kill you quickly, then Kellogg's and Kraft and, and Mondelez, their attorneys wouldn't let them sell it because yeah. that would be a lawsuit if it killed you quickly. That's called poison. Oh, yeah. But if it but if it kills you slowly and, and painfully over 50 or 60 years, Nobody's going to sue you for that. So that's fine. Now, let's come back around. What was I wanting to ask you? Ah, I want you. We have healthcare providers and dietitians watching right now. I've been seeing them in the comments. Sure. And a lot of those, a lot of them are stuck in. Uh, they're a healthcare provider for a big clinic or a big yeah. hospital chain, or they're a dietitian who works, you know, for a 20 hospital chain. They want to help their patients actually get better. They don't want to just manage chronic disease. Give us, give, give them some ninja level advice. How are they going <laughs> to help their patients, but still be able to keep the lights on and pay the car payment and the house payment? That's, you know what, I, I, God, I wish I could give you super ninja level advice, but you know, I, I, I'm not in a position to tell anyone to get fired or to, you know, it, it, most hospitals, you are required to follow these guidelines. You absolutely have to, you know, and, and like once it morally and ethically, like I struggled with that. 
And, you know, I lost all my um, dietitian hours. I was actually put in the call center. And at that point, like when I had to just take calls and patients were ordering, you know, and that's when I left, you know, but once again, I had to, um, it's, it's hard. Cause I mean, I, I have student loans. I'll probably be paying off till I die, you know, and I, I now work um, in the meat industry and I make about, you know, it went from, hey, you, I hear you, you know, as a dietitian, you can make 36, you know, $40 an hour. And now I'm like making minimum wage, <laughs> like back when I was a kiddo again. So I, I, I don't have a good answer for what to do. I mean, what, what I've asked with, I've had other dietitians do is I said, you know what, start hustling on the side, start, you want to help people see if you can start your own coaching clinic, get with other dietitians, because once you grow that, you can leave. You don't have to stay in a shitty situation, yep. you know, and I get it. If you need to stay to, to feed your family and do other things, but if you are a good person, it's going to start to hurt. It's going to start to wear in your soul. I've never met somebody who it hasn't, you know, and I have, sometimes people are like, I just don't even think about it. I just do it and leave. And I'm just like, Oh God, like, I just, got, I can't do that. I wish I did. I didn't care, but I do. So yeah, I, I would encourage, I yeah, I would never, encourage anyone. I could start. never throw the party line. I couldn't do that. And I don't think you could do that either. But there are a lot of people who are tied to a job and they're like, yeah, yeah that, you know, I would love to have a private practice, but that ain't going to happen by the time the next house payments do. And so uh, I've had a couple of nurse practitioners who work for large clinics say mm -hmm. that, you know, they would give the patient the, the handout they were supposed to give. And, and most patients can tell you're different right up front. They're like, you, yeah, yeah. you're not playing by the rules, are you? And then she would hand them a second handout under that, like palm in a card and say, when you get home, throw the top one away. Read the bottom one and don't tell anybody where you got it. So, you know, <laughs> you know, you can always, I, I will neither confirm nor deny that I have um, given advice and charted something differently. So you can always say, hey, if, you know, I'm going to chart that we talked about the standard American diet. Would you like to hear about something that actually works? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I would either confirm murder. or deny that I ever did that or that ever happens, but um, there, there might be <laughs> ninja level advice. And, you know, most patients, sometimes you're going to talk to patients that may not be able to, you know, they might have to mentor, they might not be able to, but if you have a patient that asks you, like, what do you think? You know, yeah. I feel like you have an obligation at least to, you know, to, to tell them what they think. And it, it really breaks my heart. You know, people have asked me too, like, where did this concept of moderation come from? Like, you know, and, and, and someone said, look, Michelle, if Coca-Cola or Pepsi is sponsoring the Academy, like dietitians aren't going to walk in and give people Coke and Pepsi. And you're right. They're not, that's not what they're buying. I've never seen a dietitian like walk into a patient room and be like, how about Coca-Cola with me? But what they're buying is that key, that concept of moderation. Because nobody knows what moderation means. Does it mean a week? Does it mean every day, once a day, twice a day, once a year? Nobody knows. And you know, if they, if they, if we have your product in moderation, then I'm gonna. Once again, we know from a physiological standpoint. I drink a Coke. Blood sugar goes up. Blood sugar goes down. Now I want more Coke. And then we have the patient that's obese and feels bad, but the dietitian said it's okay sometimes. And and then also, you know, General Mills just funded um. I get all these continuing education nonsenses and they, they send me one on regenerative ag and I'm like, oh, exciting. I can't wait. I love regenerative ag, but you read the learning objectives. The third learning objective said, dietitian will be able to discuss how packaged foods can play a role in a healthy diet. Right. Basically, the big food corporations spend millions of dollars sponsoring this continuing medical education and actually complete schools of dietetics. They do it for two or three reasons. Number one is like Michelle said, so that the message gets out everything in moderation, because that also means Coke and Pepsi in moderation. The mm -hmm. second message they want all dietitians to get out there is that all calories count. doesn't matter if the calories come from broccoli or ribeye or from Coca-Cola, all calories count. And then the third message they want dietitians to get out is that the way to lose weight is to eat less and move more. So you're not going to drink a two liter Coke. You're just going to drink that little six ounce can. And that's yeah. fine, but you got to move more. And when they get those three messages muddling up the proper human diet and proper human nutrition, that just screws everything up. And they know that they're using the to big tobacco playbook from the 1980s. They yeah. know that if they get mixed messages out there, everybody's just going to say, hell, I don't know what to tell patients. Patients are saying, hell, I don't know who's right. I'm just going to drink the Coke because that's what people are going to do. And I love it that there's a voice in the wilderness like yours, saying, hey, this is all bullshit. Don't listen to any of this. Here's what you need to do. Uh, as we wrap up, tell everybody, Michelle, where they can find you, how they can connect with you, and one more time about the book. 
Yeah. So you guys, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at run, eat, meet, repeat, as in, you know, ultra runner. Um, I have a website, the dietitians dilemma.net. And then I'm on Twitter, Michelle Hearn RD. The book, please check out the book. I'm so excited and proud of the dietitians dilemma. Um, I'm really, like I said, I'm just, I'm super excited and just real quick, one more time, if you guys are just tuning in about the book. So as my story and then, you know, five disease states, I thought I could speak really well about, I have over 180 clinical trials too. People are like, where's the evidence? Check it out. It's in there. It took a long time to, you know, <laughs> to, I'm sure, you know, we're excited. It takes forever. Um, but diabetes, mental disorders, including major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, eating disorders sarcopenia, which we could talk a whole, you know, muscle wasting, you know, I have patients that are so overly fat and under muscle, they couldn't walk a few steps to the bathroom. That's ridiculous. Nope. Um, heart disease, heart disease, higher LDL is actually good for you in the absence of high blood sugar, who would have thought? And then Absolutely. where where the nutrition guidelines came from getting started. And then if you're curious how I run, you know, do all my ultra running. <laughs> I have a lot of people that are interested about running. What do you do to run? So there's yeah. a chapter about running. I just saw two questions go by about sarcopenia and you just mentioned it. And the question that I saw was I'm 65 years old. Am I doomed to sarcopenia or is there anything I can do to combat that? Yeah, no. So yes, you can. And that was, that was something, you know, we have historical accounts and even recently people in their 102 guys running marathons. So yes. What, what's the problem right now with our current nutrition guidelines is they are way too low on protein. After the age of 30 and every decade after, your body stops synthesizing protein as well. So what that means, you need way more protein, a lot more protein. Unfortunately, what I see in the elderly population is they not only eat less protein, they tend to have less appetites overall. So they're yep. eating mashed potatoes and rolls and desserts and very little protein. So to combat uh, muscle loss, more protein, specifically animal protein, cheese, steak, uh, if you really struggle, some people tell me like, I just, I can't eat in the morning. Whey protein, I think is fine, but get those animal proteins, those eggs, and just even a small amount, you guys of, you know, it doesn't have to be huge weights out there. Anything to stress your muscles, you know, you can build muscle mass. I've seen it up into the people in their nineties out there getting more muscle. So yes, you are not too old. You are not too, there's a zillion different excuses your mind is going to give you. And here's another last thing about change. Anytime you want to change, You've got to buy into the process. This is not, it didn't take you a day or a couple of days to, you know, we're a quick fix society. We want to feel good. We want immediately give yourself a few weeks, give yourself time, time on task. It's the least sexy thing, Dr. Barry. People just want a pill or a potion, but it literally, it takes time. Yeah. Time on, that's like yeah. to be a great runner every single day I'm up running. You want to heal, eat meat and fat every single day. You need some help, reach out to a health coach, hit me up, hit Dr. Barry. We are happy to help you guys. Absolutely. Check out the book. And the more the, the more you buy the book, the more work we can do, right? We got to pay the right, bills exactly too. Now, right. that, now that I'm and no so longer a dietitian and I don't have the dietitian, how is my name spelled? My name is M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. -E. Last name is Hearn. H-U is in unicorn. R is in Robert. N is in Nancy. Then yep. R-D. And um, then what's your, what is your YouTube channel? Oh, it's just the dietitian's dilemma. So yeah, it's same as the book. So, and I, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm, inter I interview people there. It's a, uh, it's, it's fun. You know, I, I just, it, my goal when I first started, I was just angry. I was like, I'm going to start an Instagram. We're going to get a couple hundred people and let's go. And then it turned into like, maybe I should write a book. And, you know, I'm sure you wrote your book. You write this book and you're like, everybody's going to love it. And then you give it to people and it's just the editing process. I had one girl circle stuff. This is terrible. Oh, so it's a, uh, but it, I think it ended up being a really good story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody watching this, if you know someone who's suffering from chronic medical disease, share this video with them. If you know a healthcare provider or a dietitian who's giving crummy advice, share this video with them. You can share it on any social media. You can send it in an email. You can even send it in a text message if you're watching this on your phone. But the only way this message is ever going to get out there is if you share, because Coca-Cola is not interested in Michelle's message, nor in mine. Mondelez and Kraft and, and Kellogg's, they're not interested in anybody out there hearing any other message except that all calories count and eat less and move more and, and, and all things in moderation. But as we now know, that's bullshit. But these people out here are never going to hear this message if you don't share your story and share videos like this one. Thank you so much, Michelle. You and I are going to be slapping down 
plant eaters on Twitter together. <laughs> yes. And, and who knows what we'll be doing next. Thanks so much for joining me. Guys, thanks so much for sharing this video and, and uh, being part of this story, being part of this journey. We're all doing this thing, oh. you know, this grassroots movement that's literally going to change the world. We're doing it. Michelle, me, you, that's what we're doing. And we're not going to stop. And I hope you don't either. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.